Greetings and welcome there, academic proletariat, to this edition of the Fireside Chats with Mr. Olson, where we will be talking about how to write the DBQ. Now, many of you have already done this for AP World History, so it's going to be a little bit of a review. But for those of you that are looking for some clarification and some tips on how to write the most splendid essay ever, let's continue. All right, so this is just a reminder of the overview of the exam. So you're going to have two sections of your AP History test, and this goes for World and U.S., so if you happen to have stumbled upon me by accident, for AP World, that's okay. You can stick with me through uh, until till the end. So your exam's gonna have two parts. Part A is gonna be your multiple choice and short answer. You have 55 multiple choice questions, and then and have three short answers. Your, one of them is gonna be a choice. You're gonna have 40 minutes to do it, and that'll be 60% uh, of your overall exam score, 40% to the multiple choice, and 20% to those short answers. You're then gonna get a 10 to 15 minute break, and you're gonna come back and do the writing. Now it's important to keep in mind that you're the written part of the exam is lumped together into one hour and 40 minute time slot. So you're going to have to do a good job of managing your own time. The DBQ is the first question in the packet. It's the one that you'll, you'll see first and probably will be the one that is uh, giving you the most butterflies. Um, it's worth 25% of your grade. Um, you're going to get roughly 45 minutes to write the essay and 15 minutes to read it. But a lot of the time students find that um, reading takes a little bit longer than 15 minutes, okay? And then after that, you have 40 more minutes to write the long essay, but it's perfectly fine to cut into your long essay time as a DBQ is worth more. Okay, so here's some DBQ basics. Like I said, you get 60 minutes to write it, and the essay the essay question or the prompt is often going to have more than one part, so it's essential that you read it more than one time. At the end, you're going to have a multi-paragraph essay that's going to have in it a hot introduction. We'll talk about what that is in a second. Two to three body paragraphs, depending on the skill that's being evoked by the question, and a stop conclusion at the end. There are seven documents that you're going to be given um, in the document series. You have to try and incorporate six. I would suggest incorporating all seven in case you make a mistake, and you really want to try and source five of them. The College Board only uh, gives you a point if you source three of them successfully. However, it's difficult to source them, so if you can try and do more to sort of build in a spare tire, that would be a good idea. The other thing that makes this essay different than the long essay is that you have to include outside information, information that is not included or referenced in any of the documents. So it's essential that you know what's in the documents so you can identify identify things not in the documents to include in the essay. So here are your goals in a DBQ. The first thing that you want to do is answer the question. So you need to be able to um, respond to the specifically asked portion of the question and respond to the, the specifically asked skill. You want to show that you understand documents and how to analyze them, and you also want to be able to show that you can use documents to help support a thesis. This means you cannot simply quote or summarize them because that does not indicate that you know how uh, to read and or analyze a historical source. You also need to show that you can include outside information that the College Board did not give you in the documents, which is why that outside info point is so important. Okay, so when we write any essay in a history class, you're uh, thinking about it in terms of one of the three historical thinking skills, comparison, causation, or change over time. It's essential that when you read the prompt the first, second, or third time, that you identify which skill the question is asking you. Okay, so let's say we have a causation essay. If you have a causation essay and it asks you for the relative causes or the relative effects and the importance of them, you should be ranking those causes or effects and uh, your thesis should be which one was most important or influential uh, to, to the topic at hand. If you're writing a change or continuity essay, you should have a paragraph on changes and a paragraph on continuities, arguing which one of them was most influential over time. And for a comparison essay, you should have a paragraph on similarities, a paragraph on differences, and your thesis should argue which of them was more pronounced or important to the grand scheme of history. This is a very important slide because it gives you uh, an idea of how to frame an argument. If you want to pause this or take a screenshot of it, go, go ahead. I would suggest uh, you keep this one close to you um, for the rest of the year. Okay, so let's, let's uh, look at a question. Let's assume you get a prompt and the question says, evaluate the relative importance of different causes for American involvement in the War of 1812. So you should be able to identify that first, this is a causation essay because it explicitly uses the word causes. Had it used the word effects, that should also uh, indicate to you that it's a causation essay. You should read this question three times. And once you've read it three times, you should do some sort of brainstorming. 
Okay, so let's talk about the steps to writing a successful D DBQ, and then we'll come back to the question in a second. So you're going to read the question three times. You're going to annotate the question as to what it requires you to do. And then you're going to read the documents and look for common themes to include in your thesis. I suggest that you don't write your thesis until you read the documents, because the documents might send you in some sort of direction. This isn't a manifesto. It's not a place for you to make political arguments. Um, rather, you should decide what you want to write based on the documents because they're giving them to you for a reason. Once you identify those themes and a potential thesis, that's when you want to set out to write it. Okay, so if I go back to this question, evaluate the relative importance of the different causes for American involvement in, war, in the War of 1812, you're probably thinking of things like impressment, um, Britain not le leaving Western lands, uh, Britain fueling uh, adverse sentiment between the Native Americans and uh, the American settlers west of the Appalachian Mountains. There's several different things that, that come to mind. So you're going to have to read the documents to get an idea of what they give you in order to then craft a thesis. All right, so now let's talk about how we're going to write this thing. So in your introduction, you're going to start out with your ho or your historical overview. This is just a recollection, especially for those of you that have already written an essay in class, the long essay presumably. Um, that this is the part of your essay that contextualizes or sets up the historical topic. Your goal here is to show the reader that you understand that, that historical events don't happen in a vacuum, they don't happen in isolation, that they are the consequence of a lar larger driving forces. So this is where you just show you know what's going on relatively at the time that this prompt covers. Okay, so one sentence uh, the first sentence you, you have should describe the time period before the question. So if I'm talking about the War of 1812, perhaps um, I go 20 to 30, maybe even 50 years ahead of time to talk about what's happening. America has just come into its own. It's trying to figure itself out. It's figuring out ways to apply the Constitution and so on and so on. The next two to three sentences describe the time period of the question. So something more immediate. For example, Thomas Jefferson's presidency uh, directly predates the War of 1812, so that might be a good thing that, that you followed that, that up with. Here's what you want to avoid. Your first sentence should focus on the period immediately before the topic. Don't start every essay in American history like this. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. He was a jerk, but eventually America got its independence from Britain. That shows that, that you know chronology, but that there's not a lot of substance there, so it actually makes ends up making you look worse than anything. You have to be careful with how to do your historical overview. That is not how you write one. You need to be more specific. Your fir first sentence should show explicit knowledge of history. Avoid uh, common or watered-down observations, and absolutely avoid the phrase throughout history. You should start your essay with something along the lines of between the years, dot, dot, dot. All right, so your, your first sentence is before the time period. Your second through fourth sentences is during the time period. Okay, so then once you've got your historical overview out of the way, you're going to write your thesis. Now, your thesis is a complete answer to all parts of the question. In our question, evaluate the relative importance of the causes of the War of 1812. There's really only one part to, to that question. You're evaluating the relative importance of causes. Now it's asking you for many causes, which means your thesis should acknowledge two to three causes. You need to make sure that, that your thesis has a, is clear, has a clear delineation of how your essay will be organized, which means if you clearly uh, lay out the causes you're going to talk about, those can easily transfer into topic sentences for body paragraphs. Okay, so that puts your thesis to rest. Now, after you've read and annotated the documents and figured out which um, paragraph they're, they're going to go in, this is where you have to figure out how you are going to source them or how you are going to show the reader that you understand how to analyze a document. You never, ever want to quote them because that shows that you're a better copy machine than a processor of information. Here are the different ways that you can source a document. You can do so through historical context, which discusses what historical events shaped the creation of the document. You talked about audience, which talks about how the intended audience might have affected the author's message. You can talk about point of view of the author, or how is the author's background relevant to the message in the document. And you can talk about purpose. How is what the author is trying to say or accomplish affecting or shaping what they are saying? Okay, so what do they want to do and how is that indicating or how is that informing their, their message? You choose one of those four ways and it's easy to remember because they spell the acronym HAPPY. 
And the why in the end is, of course, why you're using this do document to help your argument. Okay, so you want to try and do that for at least five of the documents in your essay. The more, you, the more you're able to do it with, the better, because it sort of uh, builds in this safety net that allows you uh, more uh, mar margin for error in other parts. Okay, now, this is kind of unique and idiosyncratic, but remember this rule. It's rule number 473 in my nap knapsack of rules, and uh, it will save you in document use 101. So whenever you use a document, it should never, ever be in the introduction. It should never, ever be in the thesis. It should never, ever be in the, in, in the topic sentence or the conclusion sentence of a paragraph, and it should never be in your conclusion. If it is in any of those places, it's not being used as evidence. It's being used more as a thesis. A document should not be in your thesis. Your thesis is broad and includes information about documents or is inspired by documents but does not include actual documents themselves. You should also avoid using documents in two consecutive sentences because if you do that, you have not taken the time to uh, analyze each individual do document which you are expected to do. Okay, so that's the, the crux of the, D D the, of the DBQ, using the documents to help you answer the question. You do that by talking about how they relate to your thesis and what has informed their production by the author. Okay, now the last nuance of the DBQ compared to the long essay is that you need to have one solid piece of outside information. In addition to showing you know um, how to analyze a document and that you can craft a thesis, you have to show that you know something else about history related to this time period. So it can be some sort of significant not knowledge of a term, an event, a person, a law, etc. that you are using, but you have to explain it fully. This should be about three sentences. It's an entire... Um, you usage of a piece of evidence. So just like you would use a document to help support your thesis, you use this piece of outside evidence to support your thesis as well. Okay, in other words, what else do you know about the War of 1812 that's not included in the documents that, that you're given? All right, so this is of course going to be contingent uh, to the documents that uh, you have at your, your disposal. When we work with this particular DBQ, you're going to be given documents and looking for outside information will be essential. Now, when you, uh, you're done with your body paragraphs that ha have included the documents and your analysis, you're then going to stop by offering perspective and stating your thesis again. So when you do this, you can do, do it one of two ways. You, you can either talk about an other time period or you can talk about an other place which relate to the topic that you're discussing. This is very, very easy for the War of 1812 because it's a war against Britain in which America was fighting for its autonomy and its relative independence. Can you think of another period in which America tried to disassociate or distance itself from an overbearing England? I can, and you should be able to as well. Okay, so let's take a look at, at one dot document in particular. And if you're in my class, you're going to be working with all nine of these. But we're just going to look at this one because it's really fun. Okay, you can see that we have a political cartoon. And the words aren't really necessary. We'll just sort of look at what's go going on with uh, the people. You have this person dressed over here in a very um, nice and clad uh, army outfit. And I'll tell you that they are British. And as you can see, they're interacting with the Native Americans here. And uh, this particular Native American has a gun around his uh, tor torso here. And the gun says, reward for 10 scalps. Okay, and as you can see, he's handing the scalp over to this British officer. Over here, then, the more disturbing part of the image, if this isn't disturbing enough, another Indian is scalping an American troop on the ground. Now, presumably, he's doing this in an effort to try and retain more weapons. So, how do we use this to answer our question? Well, first of all, it informs my thesis by giving me a reason Americans joined the War of 1812 or participated in the war. They were mad that the British were um, sort of conniving against them with the, the Native Americans to inflict pain and suffering on uh, set settlers in the West. So that's going to be a part of my thesis. So what I do is I explain this source and, and I describe what's go go going on is that the Indians are being paid in weapons to scalp American settlers, and then I source it. So if I want to source this, I can do so historical context, audience, purpose, or 
point, point, point of view. I'm going to do this one through purpose because historical context in this one is kind of uh, difficult. You, it can be done by talking about things like Jay's Treaty or the fact that the British wouldn't leave their forts in the western part of the then United States. Uh, but I'm going to do purpose. So the person who's drawing this is obviously doing it in, in a manner of being anti-British. Why would they want to be anti-British in the midst of this entire controversy between Britain and the United States? Well, they would do so in an effort to get somebody to have more sentiment against the British and perhaps support the war. So the purpose of this document is to get somebody on board with either having negative feelings towards the British or uh, fostering support for the upcoming or already go, going on war. Now, you're going to have a lot more information about the document when, when you're given them uh, that will help you through it, but it's, it's essential that you take the time to truly analyze a document and pick which of the sourcing modes, historical context, audience, purpose, or point of view, you can explain the best and with the most clarity. Okay, so that's just an overview of the DBQ. Basically, if I had to boil it down to this, I would say that it's, an, it's a long essay question in which they have given you most of the evidence. Remember, you got to pick one outside piece of your own. However, shouldn't be that hard with the level of instruction that you've gotten all year. All right? I hope this makes more sense. And if you have any questions, let me know. Peace.